All right. Some of these are pretty straightforward, but I thought running the gamut might be nice. Certainly everyone would spot emphysematous cholecystitis. It, it was a question that plagued me for a long time though. Uh, is it, wait a minute, is it in the wall? Is it in the lumen? Can it be both? Can it be just one or the other? What are we really calling here? And in fact, it can be both or either. Uh, typically, I over the years, I've come to believe it, it probably starts in the wall. You get a, a rent in the mucosa and ultimately we'll get it in the lumen. Uh, the thing to really note about this is don't call and say, wow, this person must be really sick, right? Uh, these people can die without ever running a fever, spiking a white count, et cetera. Frequently, they are diabetic. And uh, I have, you know, one regret from my ER days, and it was a failure to diagnose emphysematous cholecystitis. So uh, I can tell you it can be incredibly clinically uh, sneaky, surreptitious. All right, our next one. Great case here. Uh, not the kind of thing you can typically spot on plain film, but this is new mobilia. There is the common duct, all full of gas. And look at that dilated proximal bowel. It's actually cutting off right there at the uh, junction of the third and fourth portions of the duodenum. This is a gallstone ileus. So even on this mag view, you can't actually see the obstruction. It's probably right there on the patient's left. Uh, but as you know, frequently they are not visible on plain film. Uh, it would be a tough call, but you've got the combination of pneumobilia dilated small bowel, and now you know that the distal duodenum is the second most common region for a gallstone ileus to hang up, uh, ileocecal, of course, being first. This is just a tough eye case uh, that's uh, worth showing you just so you don't get fooled. I've done so many resident reviews over the years, and this is one that fools people all the time. They'll call it pneumatosis of the ascending and transverse colon. But in fact, it is pancreatiform, and that is uh, devastating, emphysematous pancreatitis. In just a 44-year-old patient, that's one from George Barnes, too. George always wrote the ages and uh, little factoids on his films, so you can, you can spot them a mile away. All right, here's another one that has fooled many a resident. This one they will frequently call pneumatosis of the descending colon and sigmoid. But in fact, that upper portion you can see is really pretty reniform, and this lower streaky collection of gas is actually conforming to the ureter. So this is extensive emphysematous pyelonephritis and ureteritis, almost always in diabetics as well, and almost always resulting in the removal of the offending organ. All right, this one is a case of amoebic colitis, and the finding to point out here is the thumb, print, thumb printing. That actually looks like a thumb, doesn't it? Uh, pretty impressive. So that kind of fold thickening is suggestive of a severe colitis, and this was indeed, that doesn't get much more severe than amoebic colitis. So that's a case from my early days in Tucson, where we saw plenty of that uh, from Mexico. All right, this is a tough call to make sometimes, I think at least until you've seen it, uh, but look at those linear gas collections along the lesser and greater curvatures of the stomach. That is gas trapped in the lesser sac and lying up against the omenta in a supine patient. So that's the appearance of posterior gastric ulcer perforation in a supine patient. Very worth knowing. You can actually say this guy's got a perforated posterior gastric wall ulcer. All right, another unusual location of free intraperitoneal gas. You certainly would spot that subdiaphragmatic gas and a beautiful example of small bowel obstruction with the stacked coin appearance of those bowel loops. But that little sliver right there is actually gas in the portal region. I have Dr. Stanton to thank for this one, to thank for this one as well. 
that is just right up there in the portal region, that tiny sliver. It can be very, very subtle. But obviously, if that's the only manifestation of free gas in a given patient, you're going to want to be able to spot it. This one's got just about all of them. So in the right upper quadrant, note that streaky appearance. Pretty neat. That is the that is free subdiaphragmatic gas outlining the leaves of the diaphragm. That is the so-called leaping dolphin's sign. Okay, so that is subdiaphragmatic gas. It can have kind of an unusual appearance. This one can too. This is gas trapped under the central tendon of the diaphragm. It's just below the uh, the right ventricle there, as you can see, and it has sort of an unusual appearance, not the typical uh, nice crescentic subdiaphragmatic gas we're used to seeing. And then lastly, you can see the outer wall here of the small bowel, which is also dilated, but another example of Riegler's sign. You can see there's gas up against this wall right here. So this was a patient with ischemic bowel and a gut perforation with many manifestations of free intraperitoneal gas. All right, this is a case of ischemic bowel as well. I can't point out enough, and I, I think I will multiple times tonight, in fact, uh, but it's so important to spot pacemaker devices. It usually means that that patient is at risk for all kinds of things. Uh, specifically clotting and thromboemboli, right? In addition, spot valve replacements because the risk of endocarditis as well as bleeding from their extensive uh, anticoagulation. So I think heart findings on abdominal films can be uh, underappreciated. There is a little bit of pneumatosis just along the top side of this uh, bowel here, and there are actually a few other instances where it's probably present elsewhere in the abdomen. But here is the definitive finding. It's tough to find uh, portal venous gas on a plain radiograph. It, uh, it's not the kind of things people survive for very long, and it can be a pretty subtle finding. But there it is, that's portal venous gas, and this was a case of ischemic bowel due to an SMA thromboembolism. And we'll finish plain radiographs with a classic sigmoid volvulus. This one doesn't even require annotations. The classic coffee bean appearance of a sigmoid volvulus.